who needs who needs an introduction? <laughs> yeah, I'm on family here. Um, you can turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter two. Um, I of course will have all the scripture up on PowerPoint, but um, it can be helpful, and maybe you have a different translation. So it would be fun to compare and contrast. Um, good to be with you all again this morning on this hot day. I'm not going to wear the preaching jacket today because <laughs> it's too warm. <laughs> um, so I want us to take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at the whole chapter because I, the letter to the Ephesians, it, it, it's a great, it, it's probably my favorite book of the Bible. Um, and partly because what Paul does is he uh, covers everything he's taught in all his other letters. <laughs> this is one of the last letters he wrote. He synopsizes um, a lot of the same territory he's covered elsewhere. And it also, Ephesians emphasizes uh, the church. And uh, just in case you were curious, do you know where Ephesus was? Uh, it's right there. <laughs> what is now modern Turkey, right? Western, western edge of Turkey. Um, this was a church that Paul had planted, had visited on a number of occasions, had spent quite a bit of time uh, in building. And so he writes this letter to kind of cover all the basics of the Christian life and church life. And chapter two is a wonderful encapsulation of the whole gospel. That's what I want to talk with you about this morning is the whole gospel. Um, and so let's just dive in here and look at the opening uh, nine verses. Uh, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So as you look at those first nine verses, and I, I read into verse 10 there, um, it, it's really interesting what Paul's doing. He first uh, is talking about personal salvation here. Um, and in the opening three verses, he gives us the bad news. Now, you maybe heard me talk about this before. It's important if we're going to get a hold of the good news, we have to understand that there's bad news for which we need good news, right? And so Paul says, look, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We were dead. This is a very strong term. We're kind of maybe used to this text and we sort of breeze over it. But Paul's saying, you were dead. <laughs> That's pretty serious. You were dead. Um, and you're dead because of sin, sin with a capital S, our rebellion against God, which produces all kinds of sins, little sins in our lives, or great and small sins. But it's that sin with a capital S, that rebellion against God, that has put us into a state of death. We're walking dead, right? Um, and then in verse 2, he says, in which you formerly walked, this is, this is what you were, you were dead, uh, and you walked in this uh, uh, life that was, you thought was free. I mean, most people think they're living a free life. You know, they, this, is, this is something that we value greatly. We want to have the freedom of choice, the freedom to do what we want to do, freedom to self-actualize, right? And Paul says, well, you might have thought you were free, but you weren't. You were dead and you were controlled. This is, this is bad news. You know, you were, you were not free. You were controlled by the culture. You were even controlled by demonic forces in the world. And then in verse 3, he says, among them, we too all formerly lived 
in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath. So he says, out of that rebellion to God and that control of culture and Satan, we lived out the desires of our flesh and our mind, which were not healthy desires. And the result is that we're people under wrath. We don't like that word wrath. It sounds very harsh. It sounds like God's a big meanie. Um, but wrath is the expression of God's um, righteous response to sin. Uh, we want him to be a wrathful God. We don't want him to tolerate evil and sin. We want him to deal with it. And so he does. So if outside of Christ, we are people of wrath, we, we live under God's uh, coming judgment. And then verses four, uh, five, and six, you know, in verse four, there's this wonderful but. And whenever you encounter a but in the New Testament, B-U-T, um, something wonderful is going to happen. There's going to be a change. There's going to be a shift. Paul uses that little word very effectively again and again throughout his letters. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Right? God is immensely in love with us. And you might have trouble putting that together. But you say, well, he's, he, we're under his wrath and yet he loves us. But nonetheless, God doesn't have any problem holding those two things together. But because of his love, he seeks, he himself seeks a way to get us out from under his wrath, right? And verse five says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. So it's a wonderful contrast. You were dead. Now you're truly alive in Christ. It's God's doing. Christ did it uh, for you. You've been made alive. It isn't just a, some nice happenstance but it's something that God purposefully did. He acted um, to remove us from his own wrath, to bring us to a place where we would be saved. This is Christ doing. Then verse six, and raised us up with him. So not only did he make us alive, but he lavishes great stuff on us. Raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, right? So he's made us alive. He's lifted us, us up with his son out of sin and death. Right? Those, those two huge factors in the world no longer have a hold on us, no longer have a fundamental grasp of us. Sin and death have been defeated uh, through Jesus at the cross. And he's given us this eternal destiny. You know, this is the language of heavenly places. And then verse 7, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So Paul says he's going to continue to lavish good on us. He will continue to lavish his grace on us um, through Jesus Christ. So, you know, this language here, you were dead, but now you're alive. You know, Jesus is in the resurrection business. <laughs> it's not he rose, but then he shares his resurrection life with all who believe in him. He's in the resurrection business. And then verses eight and nine, very famous verses, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, I don't know if you notice, if you look at, the, at those first nine verses, Paul has mentioned grace three times, right? In verse five, verse seven, verse eight. It's grace, grace, grace. In other words, it's all God's doing. You didn't do it. You didn't save yourself. You didn't in any way impress God. You were dead. How can a dead person do anything? Right? You're, you're lying there dead, whether you knew it or not. And God acted on your behalf out of his grace, out of his great uh, love for you. And so there, there, are, there are three hallmarks of the whole gospel that Paul is mentioning here in chapter 2 of Ephesians, and this is the first one. The first hallmark of the gospel, and the, the central hallmark, is salvation by grace. Salvation by grace. That each person has the opportunity to accept God's grace into their lives and be saved. Then the second hallmark is just in this one verse, verse 10 here. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. 
So you know, what's this teaching about here? That we've got work to do. That we're not just saved and we get this kind of ticket to heaven and well, we wait for that to happen. <laughs> but we have a job to do. We have been created for good works, for good works. Jesus has things for us to do. And remember last month, I talked to you about how Christians should be gads. Anybody remember what that means? Um, we looked at the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. We looked at uh, Matthew 25, where Jesus talked about the, sheep, the separating of the sheep and the goats. And particularly in the, in the story of the Good Samaritan, he says to the theologian who's questioning him, go and do the same. Be like the Samaritan. That's what a gad is. Go and do the same. <laughs> right? Gads. We're to be gads. We're to be go and do the same people. Go and do the same people. Uh, do what the good shepherd did, G.S., good shepherd. Uh, and what the sheep, and as Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats, remember in Matthew 25, he says, the sheep, you visited me in prison. You cared for me when I was sick. You know, all those wonderful things that you're doing outwardly um, for others. Gads are people who have been saved from death to life, who've, who've entered into the truth of verses one through nine, and now walk in good works, and now move into verse 10. And gads are people who do justice, love uh, kindness, and walk humbly uh, with God, like Micah 6, 8 calls God's people to do. So we're to be gads people, and, and that one little verse in verse 10 is sort of summing all this up. Paul only gives it one sentence here, even though it's a very crucial concept, um, but he talks about it in more detail elsewhere, the other apostles do, and certainly Jesus does. I mean, too often we as Christians uh, focus on good words and not good deeds. You understand what I mean by that? When I say good words, we're concerned about doctrine, having good theology, and that, that's good. We should. <laughs> we should be. I'm not discounting having good words. Or maybe we think about good words in terms of apologetics and evangelism. We know how to speak to people about Jesus. Yeah, that's important too. But we sometimes put so much emphasis on good words that we forget about that we are created for good works, for to do good deeds, for to do good deeds. So by good works, Paul and the New Testament writers are referring to the, the whole mindset of putting others first, putting others first and doing good deeds for them, serving others, loving others. But let me just very quickly run through a few texts here for you. Um, we're not to uncouple faith and works, right? Um, the, the, what happens is we're very careful to say that salvation is not by works. We don't do good deeds to get saved, right? That's not going to earn any credit with God, right? That's, that's a good evangelical Christian understanding. So we, we're very good about camping on that. We're also careful to say salvation is not faith plus works, right? So works has, you know, Paul says, you, you don't have anything to boast about. <laughs> works has no part in your salvation. However, once you're saved, <laughs> works should be happening, should come out of your life. And so this is what we sometimes neglect, is to say that salvation should produce good works, right? So works don't save us, but works should come out of our salvation. So just look at, just consider these passages very quickly here. Here's Jesus speaking from just from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, he says in verse 21 of Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, right? Aren't those good words? <laughs> says, but not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. And then in verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, not just believes them, but acts on them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. In verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on sand. And in Luke 8, 21, Jesus says, he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God 
and do it. And do it. We tend to stop it, hear the word of God, and maybe we say, and believe it or accept it, which is true. We should do that. But Jesus says the real proof of the pudding is when you do it. <laughs> That's how I know you believe it. In Luke 11, 28, Jesus says, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Not just accept it mentally, <laughs> but observe it in their lives. In John 13, 17, Jesus says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them, if you do them. And James, in his letter, chapter 1, verse 22, he says, prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Can I be honest with you? I think a lot of Christians today are running around deluding themselves because they think they have the right words. They've heard the right thing. They've amen that, but they're not doing it. It's, it's not affecting their lives. It's, it's in some sort of salvation compartment <laughs> that they feel like i've got my fire insurance i've got my ticket to heaven <laughs> i'm okay you know? but jesus says and the, the apostles get it right they they understood jesus is teaching and to really flesh this out james says in chapter 2 14 through 17 what use is it my brethren if someone says he has faith but he has no works now don't misunderstand james he's not saying that you need works to get saved He's saying, if you have genuine faith, works will be there. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So James understood Jesus' teaching. We need to be doers of the word. We need to hear what he has to say, Jesus, and do it. Do it. And crucial, crucially is loving our neighbors, right? So what we talked about last month. This is what Jesus teaches in Matthew 25 and with the Good Samaritan. So the Christian life is not merely theoretical, <laughs> but it's practical. As I often say, good theology is practical theology. It should affect your life. It should change your behavior. Christians and churches should be about good works, uh, good words and good works, good words and good deeds. So that's the second hallmark of a whole gospel. There's personal salvation, but per then secondly, personal salvation that leads to outward ethics. In other words, we act morally, we act um, uh, proactively as well as reactively in good toward others. All right, so we've got two, two hallmarks, number three now. The third hallmark of the gospel is the rest of the chapter. And it's interesting that Paul spends so much time on this. But let's, we'll look at it in just a second here. I want you to note, whoops, I want you to note that the, the whole chapter is uh, Paul uses plural pronouns. So salvation and good deeds are experienced corporately. Yes, each one of us, each person has to personally decide for Jesus. But we then immediately uh, enter into a community of faith. And as we move outward in that second hallmark of the gospel, we do that corporately, not just individually. I mean, just look at those, some of those opening passages, four, five, six, and seven. Now, God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. Now, Paul could have said you, but he, he puts it in the plural because he knows the Christian life is a plural experience. It's a corporate experience. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us. You see how it goes. So the whole chapter is in the plural. All the yous are plural in, in this chapter. It doesn't, you know, we have trouble in English capturing that. In, in the Greek, you, it would be obvious. Um, so be, beware of an individualistic reading 
of this chapter and frankly of any book of the Bible. We tend to read it very individualistically. So knowing that Paul is speaking to the whole community, you know, let's, let's consider the rest of this chapter now, verses 11 through 22. Uh, I'm going to just read it through so that we can kind of hear the whole argument, and then we'll unpack it. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Okay, this is a complicated sentence, right? What Paul is talking about is Gentiles are anybody who's not a Jew, right? So that's a lot of different kinds of people, right? Um, and so they, they don't have circumcision. They don't have that sign of being part of the Jewish uh, faith, being of the Jewish community. And so the circumcision are his way of referring to Jews. So he says, look, you, you, you Gentiles um, in the flesh, um, remember verse 12, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, right? You weren't part of the chosen people who were receiving this special revelation. You had really no knowledge of God. And strangers of the covenants of promise, and he's thinking about Old Testament promises made to Abraham and Moses and the people of Israel, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, here's another one of those buts, <laughs> but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might re reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death uh, the enmity, verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, and in whom you also are being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. I find this one of the most exciting passages of the Bible. It's just, it's kind of mind-blowing. Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying a, a hallmark of the gospel is people coming together. Right? Ephesus was a multi-ethnic church. You had people of all different backgrounds, different nationalities coming to Ephesus, this prosperous seaport town. And so we will miss the beauty of what Paul is advocating here if we don't know that he's talking to a very diverse, you know, ethnically, culturally diverse church and saying, you know, this is the way life is supposed to be. Again, we tend to read this passage very individualistically, and we, we need to take those glasses off. Um, we, it's not simply about how you get saved, but it's about the community in which you get saved in too. Paul has a grander vision uh, of what is happening. He sees that salvation should necessarily lead to people coming together from different age groups, different economic backgrounds, different educational levels. Um, and different racial backgrounds. He, he's reflecting on all that God has been doing throughout human history. It, most significantly, the, the promise to Abraham. You may know this, but in case you missed it, in Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3, there's this wonderful promise as God calls Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and journey off. What's interesting, God doesn't even tell him where he's going. He just says, go <laughs> and trust me, Abraham. And he, he gives him this promise. He says, uh, now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. Wow, that's, wow, that's a wonderful promise. I'm sure Abraham was very psyched about that. I will bless you. Okay, great. Keep it coming um, and make your name great fantastic and so you shall be a blessing 
oh, now that's kind of interesting. Did you see a little bit of a turn there? So it's not simply that Abraham is going to receive all this stuff, but blessing is to flow out of him. In verse three, and I will bless those who bless you, I, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. When God creates the Hebrew people, the Jewish nation, he's doing that to reach the whole world, not just to save one people group. They're supposed to be his missionary society. And so this is part of this first uh, Israel covenant, as you would, um, between God and the people of Israel, who will eventually be called Israel. It says, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Jesus gives a, a commandment, which he calls the new commandment. He says, the new commandment I give you in John 13, 34, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now you think, well, that's not exactly new. It's said in the Old Testament, right? Love God, love your neighbor. Well, it's new because Jesus is now making it a reality and empowering us to actually do this. And then he gives us the great commission at the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, 19. What does he say? Go, therefore, and make disciples of who? All nations. Yeah, all nations, right? Gee, that sounds like the promise to Abraham. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we have at the beginning, early on in Israel's history, this promise that God was raising up a people to reach all nations. Then Jesus comes, and he's the fulfillment of that promise. He's the guy who will reach all nations. And he says, now you're going to love all nations, love one another, just the way I've loved you. So go, go and make disciples of all nations, of all people groups. The Greek word is ethnos, where we get our term ethnic. Um, so it, it means people groups. Don't think of political nations, but like tribes, people groups, language groups, whatever, ethnic groups. And where is all this headed? We get a glimpse in Revelation, right? Revelation 5 and Revelation 7. This is what Jesus is looking forward to. This is what God has been working toward throughout history. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. We see the saints, the saved, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you, this is to Jesus, to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, who? Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. I love the, the four, four ways of expressing this. That's to really emphasize them. And four, you come across this language throughout the Bible, the four corners of the earth, right? It's the way of talking about the whole earth. Right, so God has been saving people, and, and Jesus brings about the salvation of people from everywhere, from every background, every people group, every tribe, every time. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So he, he, it's not only just, he's not kind of just saving them and then keeping them in their own boxes, but they come together as one kingdom. And then in Revelation 7, 9 and 10, after these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count. Where are they from? From every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So here's this marvelous vision that John has of uh, of people of all different backgrounds, all different ethnicities, all different language groups, all different cultures coming together and worshiping the one true God. And this is what the church is to be a foretaste of. The church is to be the living reality of the promise to Abraham, the desire of Jesus, and the reality of what is coming that John gets a glimpse of in Revelation. That's what the church now should be, a testimony to every tribe and tongue and nation coming together. So look again at Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 13. There it is again, that but now, he, you know, he'd said in uh, verses 11 and 12, Gentiles and Jews were far apart. 
They, they weren't together. There were the Jews and there was everybody else. It says, but now through Jesus, everybody else is being brought into these covenants, into these promises that God had made in the Old Testament. There's a dramatic change. Something wonderful has happened. Those who had no life in God now do have life through the blood of Jesus. You who are formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. And 14, 15, 16. For he himself, now you see I've highlighted a bunch of things here. So he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now I've got peace highlighted. Peace peace in verse 15, and then put to death enmity in verse 16. Next month, I'm going to talk to you about peace. And this is a wonderfully rich term, really the Hebrew term shalom best captures the idea, and we'll, we'll think about that next month. But you get what Paul's saying. Because of what Jesus has done, he's making peace between people. He's bringing both groups, and remember when you know, he, he's just using that kind of Hebrew thinking of two different kind of people groups in the world, Jews and everybody else. So we know that everybody else is a lot of different people groups. He's saying, look, they're all coming together as one, into one. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. And that's a reference to the temple, you know, because, well, yeah, Gentiles could go uh, up to the temple in Jerusalem, but only so far. And then there was a wall <laughs> and it, and it literally said, no Gentiles past this point. And the more, the more Jewish and the more holy you were, the further closer to God you could get. Jesus has torn that wall down. And he dies on the cross and the veil rips. That's, that's a symbol of what's happening. Everybody has access to God now through Jesus. And in verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is in the law of commandments, contained in ordinances so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. So two into one, two into one. This is interesting math that God is up to. This is what he wants to do. The result is, is peace. It's bringing people together as one, one new man, one body. Look in verse 16 and might reconcile them both in one body. So in verse 14, he says, making them one. Verse 15, one new man. Verse 16, in one body. Paul just is emphasizing, emphasizing, emphasizing that we're to come together across whatever divisions humans come up with. Just forget those divisions. We come together in Christ. We are reconciled in Christ. The dividing wall is down. And, and note the tenses. That's what's in uh, green there. It's all past tense, right? What does that mean? For he himself is our beast who made both groups into one. And he broke down uh, the barrier of the dividing wall. He uh, abolished in the flesh the enmity. Now, that's abolishing. Whoops. Did I go back by mistake? Um, having put to death in verse 16. So here's what Paul's saying. Jesus did these things in the past through the cross so that he can make a, a, a all people groups one and give them peace with one another. And so what that means for us today is that we can have a profound confidence that Jesus is ahead of us in all this, <laughs> that his passionate desire is to see people come together. He's ahead of us. This is, this is positional truth. In Christ, eternally, we are all one in Christ. No matter what differences we're having here on earth, this really exists. And so our task now, Paul is not ignorant of the fact, the reason he is teaching this and affirming this is because he knows it's a struggle. <laughs> he knows it's hard for people to get together, particularly people who are not like each other. Back in the late 80s or 90s, throughout the 90s, and you still see it today, there was this movement called the, the church growth movement. And it's basically asked the question, how do, we, how do we grow our churches? How do we get them bigger? Um, and uh, some of these 
Christian theologians, Christian sociologists, they said, you know what we need to do? We need to make homogenous units of our churches. In other words, birds of a feather like to flock together. They don't like to hang out with other birds. <laughs> um, so, you, you know, you need to just say, well, this church reaches this people group, you know, this this type of person, you know, this is will be a middle class church. This will be a poor church. You know, it's that kind of idea. That has nothing to do with scripture. It may be true that the things tend to work that way in a fallen and damaged world. But if the church is going to be the testimony of what John was seeing in Revelation, we got to get past the homogenous unit principle. Jesus did these things in the past through the cross so that he could make all people one. God wants people to be in harmony with one another. He wants us to be at peace. And when we are, that's a testimony to God's grace and glory. Look at verse 17 and 18 again. Paul reemphasizes what Jesus has done by quoting from uh, Isaiah 57. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So to the near are the Jews, and the far away are everybody else. But the gospel is being preached to everybody. And then there's this wonderful Trinitarian affirmation here, for through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So the him is Jesus. You got three, the three persons of the Godhead there. But get what he's saying. We both, in other words, Jews and everybody else. In other words, everybody has the same access to God through Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. All gain relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit's indwelling work in our lives. And verse 19 says, then, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. You are, you are, you are. Paul's saying, this is what you truly are. And he's saying that so that we will pursue living it out in reality. We're no longer aliens and strangers. He says we're all family. We're all family. Every, everybody, we should be regarding every Christian as one of us, no matter where they're coming from. And we're all fellow citizens. Everyone in Christ belongs to the same nation. And we sang that wonderful song about the kingdom, bring your kingdom here. Um, this is our loyalty now before any earthly nation. I mean, it's fine to have loyalty to your earthly country, but it should never supersede your loyalty to God's country, to God's kingdom. And Paul says we're of God's household. That's that family language. We belong, all belong together in Jesus's family. You know that do you know that old saying you can choose your friends but you can't choose your relatives or you can't choose your family right that's true of the church <laughs> you know there may be some people some christians you're like i can't believe i'm related to them in christ but you are you are and we need to act that way verse 20 having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets christ jesus himself of being the cornerstone we're the things that Paul says in verse 19 because of what has happened in verse 20, right? Because of Jesus being the cornerstone, we're being built together. Verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So you see, Paul is a realist. He's saying, here's the truth about who you are, but you're growing into it. <laughs> it is growing. So there's this past truth of the work that Christ has done, but we have to move into the reality of that. And what is it that we're growing into? A holy temple. A holy temple in verse 22, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That is really a challenging text. Again, it's, it's maybe the kind of verse we breeze over, but if you think about it, Paul is saying, you're not going to enjoy the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, unless you're in harmony with people that you normally wouldn't be in harmony with. It's people coming together from all backgrounds, all tribes, that creates a dwelling place 
for God's spirit. If we don't foster multi-ethnic, multicultural unity, then we're undermining God's temple. We won't experience the Holy Spirit in our midst. If we've truly been saved, first nine verses, then our character, our thinking, our behavior, and our relationships should be transformed. They should change. They should change. Everything about us should change, and especially our relationships. I, you know, often as we read the letter to the Romans, and it's a, it's a, a, a theology-heavy, doctrinally heavy letter, right, um, for 11 chapters. And then you get to 12 through 16, and it's all about relationship. And Paul's saying, okay, I've laid out all this theology for you in 11 chapters, though he didn't write in chapters. Um, and then he says, now that tra should transform how you think. He starts in verse in uh, chapter 12. And, and then he immediately presses out into relationships, relationships with other Christians and relationships with non-Christians. Personal transformation through salvation in Christ should lead to relational transformation. So that's the third hallmark of a whole gospel. Personal transformation leads to reconciled relationships. All right, so let me wrap it up here. I'm saying what Paul, we tend to, to stop when we say, here's the gospel, and we, we do verses one through nine, <laughs> get saved, right? That's where it has to start. But the whole gospel then moves into verse 10, do good works. And then verses 11 through 22, have transformed relationships. Be the church. So, you know, if you're here today or you're watching online and you're not a Christian, let's be honest. Look at the world today. The world seems particularly heartless these days, doesn't it? <laughs> It's all about power. It's all about gaining for oneself. That seems to be the order of the day. Rather than being gone or even waning, racial intoler intolerance and prejudice is on the rise. So what hope have you as a non-Christian? The only hope for this world is the way of Jesus. Only God can reconcile people and bring healing of relationships and dissolve the corrosion of enmity. Only God can turn people's hearts from self-interest to looking at others and being concerned about others. Only God gives hope for changing institutions and cultural and systemic forces that oppress people. And only Jesus can establish peace. So Jesus offers hope to a fractured world. Jesus offers life to a dead world. Jesus offers life to your dead soul. So I encourage you, if you're not a Christian, that you would consider becoming one. Talk to anybody here. Send me an email. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. But I encourage you to give your life to the Lord. Go from death to true life. Go from false freedom, which is really bondage, to true freedom. Give your life to him today and start living in his kingdom of good deeds and the one new humanity. Enter into the peace of God. For us who are Christians, so did you all see the news yesterday? The mass shooting in Buffalo? Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's terrible. The sky travels three and a half hours white supremacist guy to shoot and kill black people. He kills 10, he wounds three others. And it, he's apparently got a manifesto. I haven't heard the details of it yet. I don't know if they've revealed it yet, but you know, it's a white supremacist manifesto. This is the world that we're living in. We mustn't be satisfied with individualistic salvation ticket. <laughs> Jesus isn't. 
Jesus wants a church that is a testimony to his other caring and to racial love and harmony. Jesus is drawing us to be one people united in him, giving a profound witness to the world of the future reality of a diverse, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-age human community. I encourage you to pray and say, Jesus, how can I be a better witness for the truth that's coming, for the truth that you bought at the cross? How can we as a church um, better express human love and harmony in coming together, the, 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 the dividing wall coming down? Our, our culture, our world is desperate to see some alternative to shooting at each other. Seek out people not like yourself. People of a different race, of a different education, of a different life situation, of a different age, of the opposite gender, of a different economic status. Enrich yourself as well as be a blessing to them. Let us be a people who enter into the one new humanity that Jesus has broken the dividing wall down to achieve. Let us be a whole gospel people. Let's pray. Lord, it, it's absolutely challenging and somewhat daunting to consider these things and to live up to your expectations, but we thank you for the truth, Lord, that you have accomplished this at the cross. It's done in a very real, fundamental, eternal way. And Lord, we ask that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit, as individuals and as a people, to live out the whole gospel in the world now as we await your return. Lord, help us to be creative thinkers, to be proactive doers, to be lovers of other human beings and be a glorious testimony for you. Amen.